Mariandra, you're a victim of farm attacks. Can you tell me your story? Yes. Um, in 2016, my husband was murdered in front of us during a housebreak a farm attack, which was classified as a farm attack. We lived on a small farm northeast of Pretoria, and um, they shot him six times in front of me and my oldest daughter. Uh, we had three girls at the time, six, four, and two years old, and I was eight months pregnant with our son, our fourth child. Um, they shot him five times, and then uh, my little girl put up her hand and said, please, you can take my piggy bank. I've got money, please don't shoot my mommy. And uh, my husband got up for the very last time and they shot him in the head, execution style in front of us. So she's still traumatized, this has been two years now. Our little boy was born five days after daddy's funeral. Um, they didn't take anything, they only took our phone so that I couldn't phone for help. And living on a farm, I couldn't run to the neighbors. Uh, so it was quite a, quite a, terrifying experience. I can't what do you think the motive is if they don't take any money? Well, the, the one attacker said blatantly, we're here to kill you. When we offered them everything, I mean, my husband even told them where to find all the valuables and uh, he just said, we're here to kill you. And they did. The idea is murder and not robbery. It's not robbery has gone wrong. No, it's definitely the motive is not robbery. They would have taken stuff. I mean, we've pointed out where all the valuables were and they left with the two phones and the police actually said to me they took the phones so that I couldn't phone for help. The children and you were unhurt? We were not hurt, thankfully. And uh, we are very grateful for that because it could have been so much worse. We are one of hundreds of stories of farm attacks and the, the amount of torture that goes into these farm attacks are, are, are horrific. It's horrific. Uh, but it's also, to me, it's really unfair to be grateful that it wasn't worse uh, because we were left without our breadwinner, without my, my children are left fatherless. Um, we were left with nothing. We had to start from scratch, plus the trauma and the fear. And we live in fear after that. That's, that's part of the trauma, unfortunately. How did the police respond? The case is still ongoing. Um, no success yet, but I've made peace that there won't be. Uh, one of the senior police officers did tell me that I should prepare myself. Only 3% of these four murders actually end up in jail. So the chances of it really there being justice is close to none. Um, and yeah, the police, it's a job to them. It's, it's just work. Uh, How do you think the attackers get the idea to go out and, and kill people? Um, I've noticed, I've, I've, I've followed the trends in, 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 in the media as well. Uh, it is related to, you could say it's related to the, the hate speech comments that's been made by like the EFF, kill the bird, there's a song they sing, kill the bird, kill the farmer. Every time there's something like that, the farmer tax increased. Um, how they plan it, we do know that it takes a whole group of people to plan one attack. There's people that do surveillance, there's people that get inside info, then there's the people that actually does the, execute the attack and the people that get them away. Um, how they pick or how they choose who's next, I wish I knew because then we could prevent it. You think it's organized? Yeah, I think so. In my opinion, yes. Could the government be doing more? They could be doing more. Um, there's actually a book that Adam Rich wrote, Kill the Bird, that um, describes, he talks about in the book, the government's complicity, media complicity, to these attacks. Because they, they are not acknowledging it as a problem at all. A lot of people in uh, the West and in the United States and Europe think this is uh, all a myth that doesn't exist, or that mm. it's exaggerated. What would you say, say to them? It really does happen. It really does happen. Unfortunately, our own government uh, dismisses it uh, and say it's not a problem. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not a crisis, but it is. It happens daily. Um, it happens to normal people. It happens to good, hard-working people. We all pay our taxes. You never see it coming. I mean, um, in our case, when it happened, one of my first, first thoughts were, this can't be happening to us. This can't be happening to us. Uh, we are normal people. We went about our normal lives. We were a normal family. And the most scary thing you can think of was standing right in front of us. What do you tell the children now? Well, unfortunately, they saw 
my oldest daughter saw everything, so she has many questions um, and scary questions. We talk about blood and bullets and like it's normal, it's normal conversation in a house and people tell me, you can't talk to your kids like that. They saw it. Uh, the two little girls that were asleep in their rooms, they heard everything. Um, they were thrown into this, and it's pure evil. Um, my oldest daughter, her biggest issue now is trust in people. Because she says to me, how can people be so evil? How can they do that? How can they shoot someone six times? How can they? And I said, well, you get bad people. I can't answer all her questions. Um, it's... Why was there so much blood? The blood was so much that it seeped through the floor. It happened upstairs and we had a wooden floor. The blood seeped through the ceiling into her room below. That's how much blood there was. It, uh, you don't even see these things in the movies and it happened right in front of us. It's horrific. Uh, they are healing. She's on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication still. Um, we still, both me and her, still experience triggers and flashbacks and um, nightmares. That's part of the trauma process, to process the trauma. And it's a long road. It's a, it's a long road. I have realized three months ago she had a, a relapse in her trauma. And um, that's when I had to admit to myself I can't fix her. I, I, I can't fix my child. Um, she has been scarred for life and I need to manage this and make sure that she sees the good side of life. So that's what I've decided very early on with the birth of my son, which I was alone when he was born. I had to get up and say, you know what? These kids deserve a good life. I need to give them a good life. This will not determine the rest of our lives. They're still small. <laughs>